Nor'easter Nation, we are so delighted to have you back here on Facebook Live um, for our second workshop talking about um, health and wellness and running. Um, we have a great group of folks here in the audience sitting in our seats with alums, faculty, staff, students. We're delighted to have all of you here. And Facebook Nation, we are delighted to have you here as well. Please, if you have any um, questions about um, the talk that we're about to have, put it on your Facebook page, and we have Sarah here who will um, forward those up, all, uh, up bleh, forward these up here. Also, please just give a shout out that you're here. We would love to know. Um, we, as you may know, we are doing um, several different activities um, in relation to our sponsorship of the Beach to Beacon Race uh, 10K uh, on August 4th. We've done a couple workshops, we're doing training runs, and uh, our first workshop was with uh, Anne-Marie Davey on nutrition. And um, these workshops are all to highlight running and, and wellness generally. So whether you are a competitive marathoner, you're a first time 5K, or you just sort of feel like maybe I should do something faster than walking, all of this is great for you. And we hope that you participate in all of them because as wellness for our uni faculty and staff, our alumni, parents, friends, we really want everyone um, to, to participate. Today, we are super lucky to have one of our own, and our own in so many different ways. Lindy Libby Kelly, who is the coordinator of strength and conditioning here at UNE, is an alum, class of 2011, which is awesome. She's also a current student, which is also great, masters in applied nutrition. So we have um, tons of ways to benefit from what Lindy is going to tell us today. You will see um, throughout the presentation, um, Lindy is gonna refer to a handout. And if you would, if you were in Facebook land and would like that uh, handout, please uh, get in touch with Lindy. Her email is gonna be at the end of the presentation. And, um, we, she will send it out to you. But we're delighted to have you, and with no further ado, Ms. Lindy. All right, well thank you, Amy, I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Um, like Amy said, my name is Lindy Kelly, um, and I'm really blessed to be here today. When they asked me to do a presentation on running, I said, all right, let's do it. So um, we do a lot of work here at UNE with all of our student athletes, um, and we obviously work with our cross country teams as well, so running is one of the things that Personally, I'm not the best at. I'm um, always striving to work on that. But um, I certainly understand the strength and conditioning side of it. So that's what I'm hoping to bring to everybody today. So we'll talk about strength training to hopefully increase your performance and reduce your risk of injury. So again, thank you to Amy, um, Angela, and everyone here today uh, for having me. I have complete respect for everybody who likes to run. Because again, it's never been my forte. You could ask uh, Kurt Smythe, our current um, director of athletics who recruited me to play women's basketball here. That's not my forte. You could ask coach Anthony Ewing who coached me for four years and had to watch me struggle to run up and down the court for four years. Um, but I did my best. So I have complete respect for people who really enjoy running. Um, and as a strength and conditioning coach, that's my job is to kind of help facilitate what we love, right? So um, this is the only reason I run, usually, is to chase something like that. But this is what I know really well, okay? So um, my Athletes made me get Bitmoji, and now I'm slightly ex obsessed with all things social media. But you'll see her throughout the presentation. So um, walking the walk. Um, again, Amy mentioned that I am an alum of the university. I think it's important that whenever you're working with any sort of fitness professional um, or health-related professional, that you understand their background and their credentials. Um, and you should really seek to look for people who have that level of, of understanding. Um, because it's going to help you to the best of your abilities. So I'm lucky that UNE has given me that platform. So I was an applied exercise science student um, from 2007 to 2011, and I played basketball, which I mentioned here, which again helped me walk the walk as a student athlete. I really understand what they need and what we need to give them, right? Uh, but now being on the other side of it, right, which is what most of us are training for these days, just life, right, being an athlete of life, okay, um, is important as well. Um, I'm a certified strength and conditioning coach and a certified personal trainer through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Um, I worked at the OA Centers for Orthopedics, which they've merged with Spectrum recently in the last couple of years, for about three and a half years after school. Um, they also are a host to the Parisi Speed School, 
which is where I learned um, really how to work with runners and endurance athletes of all kinds. So um, the functional movement screen is something that I'll touch on as we go throughout the presentation, but it's a screening process and assessment that I do with all of my student athletes here at UNE. Um, and I certainly, again, out there in Facebook land, if you want more information on it and how to get hooked up with a professional who can do that for you because it can really help you understand your mechanics and what you need to do, I'm more than happy to help out. So again, I interact with Sarah and I can help with that. Uh, but it's important to understand, you know, who your, who your professional is and what they're going to be able to do for you. So what's on our radar today? And you have to forgive my nor'easter puns because I love them, okay? Um, and I have a lot of them. But we're going to talk about the anatomy of running. Because, again, when was the last time anybody in here was in an anatomy class? All right, it's been a while, <laughs> okay? Um, or something we just kind of glaze over. We don't think about the parts and pieces that, that make the movements happen, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about something called joint centration and center of gravity. Um, we'll talk about reasons for common running injuries, the benefits of strength training to prevent said injuries and hopefully increase your performance, overcoming some of those barriers to strength training that are kind of unique to the running population and everybody as well, not just saying that's a runner specific thing, but um, there's some things that we gotta talk about there. Um, some quick movement assessments that you can do at home by yourself. You don't necessarily have to have a strength coach to work with you. And then we're actually going to design our own strength program. So I want you guys to leave today with a real understanding of how you can put this to work right away. I don't want to spit information at you and have you leave like, that was great, but I don't really remember something. I want you to have something to take away. So that's what these packets are in front of you. And we'll hearken back to those as we go. So the anatomy of a runner, all right? Everybody has this in their packet right here. So those of you in Facebook land, I can send this to you if you would like. Um, this is Kira. She's one of our women's cross-country athletes here at UNE. Um, and one of the things that I do in our strength and conditioning facility downstairs is create athlete art. Like, I don't have enough to do. So <laughs> what I do is take a picture of an athlete in each of our 17 teams, and I kind of doctor it up here with different, you know, mechanics and movement patterns. And so they can understand what we're doing in the weight room how and, and how it facilitates to their sport, what they're actually doing on the court, the field, the ice, the, the course, and all of those things. So... Um, I wanted to make sure everybody had that to look at running mechanics and how they apply. So what we're going to pay attention to for the most part is this little graphic over here on the right. So I just wanted to cover some of the muscle groups that are really important for running, which is all of them. <laughs> okay? There really isn't a muscle group that isn't involved in running. Even our eyes have a, a lot to do with that and eye tracking, which is kind of interesting. But That's a whole other presentation. Um, but Working from the ground up, which is something I do with all of my athletes here in the weight room and anybody that I'm training and working with, is understanding how we have to move from our feet up. And your feet really deserve a lot of love and attention and thought, and they're really an afterthought, right? Um, how many of you, if you don't mind sharing, have ever struggled with like plantar fasciitis or something like that? Yeah, common, right? Very common, okay? Um, or Achilles tendonitis, right? Again, yes, right? Um, we'll, we'll see a lot of hands go up today because you're a population that really is it, mentally you can push through so many walls, right? Um, but we somehow need to get you some love and some strength on the other end to help prevent some of it. So our gastrocnemius, which is our calf and our soleus, so all those muscles around our ankle complex are helpful for propulsion. They push us off the ground. They're our spring complex, right, that help us move our foot and our ankle. Uh, we move up the line to our hamstrings, which are on the back of our legs, right? Our hamstrings originate at the bottom of our pelvis, and they're really important for pelvic stability um, and lower. So if you're a person who's ever had lower back pain, which I'll bring up again in a little bit, um, it might be a hamstring issue. Um, and it's usually not that the hamstrings are too tight. Everyone always blames the hamstrings. Oh, my hamstrings are tight. Usually it's a strength deficit at your hamstrings, not necessarily a tightness or a stiffness issue. Um, but they help pull your foot along the ground as a runner. Most people would think that's the quadriceps job on the front of your leg, right? Oh, that's what pushes me, right? Running is a pull. At a full speed, you are trying to pull yourself along the ground, almost like, see how that cycling motion, right, with those arrows, okay? Your body, your foot strikes right underneath or just in front of your hip. And as that happens, your hamstrings help pull you along the ground. The same is true for cycling. Do I have any cyclists in here, triathletes? Okay, exactly. Um, so both of those are hamstring dominant exercises, which is kind of crazy to think. We don't always imagine that, right? Um, again, I already mentioned the quadriceps do push us. We do need them, okay? We need for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. We love Newton, okay? I wish I knew I'd love physics as much as I do now, but when I was at UNE, I was like, just, Balada, help me get through this. 
um, but it really does apply, okay? We need the quadriceps as well. Our glutes are about hip extension. They help our, our hip extend out, right, and help get our leg back into the ground. Um, they also have a lot of other actions for support and stability that we'll talk about. Hip flexors, they help get our knee up. We need that knee drive in order to get the foot back down to the ground, right, reciprocal actions. Um, has anybody in here know they have tight hip flexors? They, they would say yes, okay, oh, for, for sure me, okay? Most of us do this. We sit, right? And that automatically puts us at a, a disadvantage. Um, the upper body, I mean, obviously we could talk about all the different muscles in the upper body. It's really about energy, energy creation, excuse me, okay? So if you look here at the picture with Kira, um, she's got kind of what we call 90-90 arm action. And that 90-90 arm action, as my left hand comes down and back, I go from cheek to cheek, okay? Not to be cheeky, but that's how it is, all right? And as I go, my left hand comes down, my right knee comes up. We work in opposites as humans. We have to work in an opposite action, reciprocal motion. So my arms actually drive my legs. They are my engine, okay? My core is about stabilization. It's about breathing. And most importantly, I think, well, breathing's pretty important, <laughs> but um, it's about energy transfer. So whatever's created at my arms has to transfer through my, my trunk, through my torso, and into my legs. If I leak energy, as I go, because my core isn't as strong as it possibly could be, that's when I run into issues and in trouble down the road. No pun intended. I didn't really mean to make that one. Um, and the shoulder girdle, again, is that, that reciprocal motion. It's what drives that arm, right? Okay. Um, generally, as runners, upper body issues aren't necessarily a big thing for us, right? Us, I should say you. Um, but they are important in what we do. And a lot of times, they're the under, our upper body's forgotten as runners, right? Because we think it's my legs that carry me places. Well, it's your arms that start the motion. Never forget that, okay? So hopefully that helped kind of just give you a reminder of what the muscles do while you're running, all right? So I call this stacking up for success and basically understanding that your stature dictates your function is a very important concept. So in the weight room downstairs, I actually have a plumb line that hangs on a string and I have my athletes come in Alyssa's here with me, one of my athletes. She'll be helping us a little bit later. Um, I just did this with you the other day. Remember that? Okay. Um, but I have us stack up. I have us line up with that string. And we're trying to make sure that that string looks more or less like the one on the furthest, your left over there by that straight up arrow, that it bisects your ear, your shoulder, your hip, your knee, and your ankle, right? If that happens, it's what we have, it's or it's what called, is what is called um, joint centration, okay? So that's when all of my muscles and joints are centered around my center of gravity. So your center of gravity is what holds you to the earth, right? We, know, we all know about gravity. Um, but it usually is centered, not necessarily just the belly button, okay? I kind of have that circled over there, but sort of just below, okay? And it changes on the person based on torso length, okay, and height, and all those sorts of things as well. But we want to centrate around our center of gravity. And if we can do that, we're going to help prevent a lot of injury. Okay, we're gonna help keep ourselves safer, right? Because we're using our body to kind of keep us upright in the right way. Um, when we start using muscles the wrong way, okay, or joints, asking joints and muscles to not do their job and to do another job, that's, that's tricky. So one of the other things I wanna talk about is called the planes of motion, the three planes of motion. So as a runner, we kinda, you guys kinda live on this sagittal view right here, okay? That frontal left and right here. So when you run, it's very much left and right. Would we agree? Okay, that's what it seems like. We really don't do a whole lot of left and right, correct? And we really don't do a whole lot of backward ever. That would be kind of weird if you were running backwards in a race, okay? Um, unlike a court sport athlete like basketball, just as for an example, obviously they run forward, but they also have to go left and right and backward as well, okay? Um, so you're unique in that way, that you live in that plane of motion, that left and right. So my hands and my knees never really cross left to right. I'm always working on one side or the other, okay? The frontal plane, which kind of if I turned sideways, right, if you were going to take a knife and cut me right down the middle and I fell into a front and a back half, okay, that's the frontal plane. Um, not much happens on the frontal plane either for runners, okay? That doesn't mean we still shouldn't train it, which is why I'm putting this up here for us. Um, and then the second one is the, or the third one, excuse me, is transverse, okay? That's rotation across your center of gravity, all right? So transverse and frontal, are ignored often. They're kind of like the forgotten friends, all right? Sagittal is always given more kind of thought, right? But in your strength program, you want to address all three planes of motion. Even though you may not do a whole lot of rotation, okay, or a whole lot of hip hinge as what we call frontal or jumping jack style, okay, working on that front to back half, 
it's still important that it's strong and healthy because that's going to support and better help your sagittal movement in that forward direction, which again, you're trying to finish a race, right? That's where we want to move to, okay? So does that make sense? Yes? Okay, awesome. So this is my soap box up here, all right? This is my uh, plow box in the weight room. Um, I was creating this little bitmoji last night, and my husband thought I was just playing. I'm like, I'm lucky that I get to play all the time. This is great. Um, but this is my soapbox, okay? And as a strength coach, this is one of the things that really gets me, okay? Movement quality plus strength equals healthy, high-performing athletes. The movement quality has to come first. So if we're trying to run a lot of mileage or we're trying to get in the weight room, which is admirable, okay, and, and start strength training, that's awesome. But we never want to lay dysfunction on top of poor movement, right? We never want to, or I shouldn't say, um, we don't want to add strength to a dysfunctional pattern. Does that make sense as well? Okay. So we want to own a movement. We want to own that movement pattern and then gain strength to support it. And that helps us run efficiently and safely. Okay. Um, and to do that, you want to incorporate some sort of assessment into your movement quality work. Okay. And that the warm up is a great place for that, by the way. And I, in this packet, you guys will see there's a warm up in there for you that addresses all three planes of motion. Okay. Um, and it does kind of cover assessment because your warm-up should be a quick little check-in with your body, if anything, every day. How many of you foam roll? Does anybody have soft tissue quality? Excellent. Okay. If you don't and you'd like to learn more about it, again, I can certainly help you with that. Um, but taking care of your muscles and your soft tissue quality is, is vastly important. It's very important. So it's always a part of our of our training here at UNE. Um, and again, with anybody that I'm working with, my athletes know they come in, they grab their foam roller, and they do their work right off the bat for the first five minutes or so before their session. And that's really all it takes. Some people think it takes a lot of time to do your foam rolling and those sorts of things. Um, really, 30 seconds per muscle group, that's all you need. So three to five minutes, and it's a quick thing, OK? Um, but that kind of helps you self-assess every day. You should assess how you're moving and how you feel. How many of you know, like on a day, you're like, oh, today is not a good day, right? Like, my miles are going to be a slog today, OK? Um, we all kind of have been there, right? Whether whatever motion or movement or sport we're doing. Um, but your warm up and your foam rolling can help you feel better and it can also help you understand where you need to go. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. We've got to make sure our movement quality is perfect first or as close to perfect as it can be and then get stronger. So when the road fight back, fights back, right? We've all, how many of you have had an injury of some sort and you don't have to share what it was, but hands go up, right? Okay, almost all of us have dealt with something at some point in time um, that's kind of nagged us or kept us out of competition. We don't, we don't want that, right? We want to get back as fast as we can and prevent it from happening in the first place if we can. So I always tell my athletes here that my number one statistic is not what they can do in the weight room. It's not their, their bench press. It's not their squat. It's not their vertical jump. Those things are awesome. I love statistics. Um, I'm a nerd for them. But at the end of the day, my number one statistic is their availability. If they're able to play and wear their jersey and do what they want to do, then I've been successful as a strength coach. And if I can't, I can't prevent everything from happening, right? Um, and if they do get hurt, hopefully I, in conjunction with our great athletic training team, we can help them bounce back quicker, right? Help them get back faster and better maybe than they were before, okay? Um, so endurance athletes are just at an at-risk population, and I'm speaking to the choir probably about it, right? Okay, um, it's just due to the highly repetitive nature of movements right, that you do. Running is a cyclical thing. It's very much the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, right, as well as swimming and biking. Yes, the course changes, and yes, um, you know, your, your body feels a little different on each day, but it is very much a repetitive motion. So overuse injuries are, are a major thing. Um, and they're usually due to a strength deficit, like I mentioned a little bit earlier. We kind of blame the muscle itself, right, but did we think about how strong it is? Can it, can it do what you're asking it to do? Can it move the way you want it to? Um, motor and neural timing issues. So what I mean by that is if I walked in and I expected the, the projector to turn on when I flicked a switch, but it turned on in the other room, that's a motor patterning issue. That's a, a neurological thing, right? I'm not controlling that necessarily. It's, it's autonomic, right, within my central nervous system. But what I'm asking something to do, it didn't do. It fired to a different place. And often that's what's going on. We can fix that. It just takes practice and in, in, in working on it, okay? Um, and then sometimes it's anatomical structure, right? And honestly, I can't fight anatomical structure, right? Um, sometimes I can't, I can't change the fact of how you're built. But what I can do is say, okay, how you, this is how you're put together. How can I best help you be successful, right? So yes, there's a correct form and technique for strength training, 
but there's also adjusting and, and finding little tweaks that are going to work best for each individual, okay? Um, and sometimes by anatomical structure, we're predisposed to certain injuries, okay? But we're also kind of self-selected into a specific type of ac activity. Does that make sense? Okay, so our body kind of can dictate as young children what we're gonna do in the future, right? If we're introduced to a sport very early on, I think most of us probably were, right? We tend to be better at it, right? We probably practiced it a lot more, okay? But if you're not great at skating, <laughs> me, okay? You're probably not gonna stay on the ice, but if you're pretty good with a ball in your hand, you might be, you know, better at basketball or better at whatever else it is, okay? Hand-eye coordination, all those sorts of things. Um, so anatomical structure di does dictate a lot. And that's where the assessments I'll talk about later kind of come in a little bit more in finding a good clinician or, or strength coach who can help you out. So how many of you have ever dealt with an IT band or runner's knee? Quote, unquote. Yep, okay. Um, low back pain. <laughs> yep. Um, hyperinflation. You may not know this one as what it says. Okay. How many of you have ever had neck pain or felt like tight stiffness in your shoulders? Okay. Hyperinflation is actually an issue with our breathing patterns. Okay, our diaphragm lives underneath our lungs, right? Okay, and our pelvic floor muscles, they work together to create a ball of pressure that supports our lumbar spine, keeps it safe while we move. But if our diaphragm isn't doing its job, then we have to use accessory muscles that are not meant to be prime movers for breathing, right? So that means our chest, our scalenes, all of these muscles in this area come up and get tight like this, okay? And then that just creates a lot of stiffness and soreness for us. Um, and that happens a lot in runners. And you just next time you're out on the course, do me a favor and watch. People become a people watcher. Okay, I do that all the time. I'll walk through the mall and I'll be like, oh, this, this, this. And my husband's like, that's weird. Stop. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I can't help it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? So pay attention to people. See if their shoulders drift towards their ears. Okay, when they run. If this kind of person exists, it's probably because they're not using their, their breathing musculature, their ribs and their diaphragm the right way. And we do have ways to fix that and work on it, but awareness is key. Awareness is key. So I wanted to touch on that because that's kind of one that a lot of runners don't realize they, they deal with, right? Like why do my shoulders always hurt? Why is my neck always sore on one side? That's probably why. It might be a, a piece of that. And this one's funny, gluteal amnesia, okay? Basically your butt forgot to work, all right? It happens. Um, our glutes are massively important for so many things. Um, but when they don't work well, we tend to get a lot of trouble at the knees. So if you're a person who's struggled with knee pain or lower back pain, it's probably because your glutes aren't doing their job. Okay. Um, so again, a little bit strange, but people with a nice booty generally are pretty healthy. Okay. Just to throw that out there, right? Um, and they generally don't have a whole lot of pain, an issue. Okay. Um, it's just one thing that is a correlation. Okay. So hopefully we don't have gluteal amnesia. We gotta wake them up, okay, make them do their jobs. Um, we wanna leverage the weight room, okay? So it's gonna help us prevent, like I just talked about, all those overuse and repetitive stress type injuries. One I didn't mention was stress fractures, okay? Um, I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with a stress fracture here. I have, okay, again, from running or shin splints. Sometimes the two go hand in hand, okay? Um, those are repetitive stress injuries that strength can affect. Um, they improve, basically the weight room can also improve um, energy use and neuromuscular efficiency, which is what I was just talking about with the pattern timing thing, right? Okay. Um, we want to make sure that you guys have good running economy. How many of you have heard that phrase before? Yeah, running economy, right? Like I want to, I don't want you to be a Mack truck wasting on a bunch of diesel, right? I want you to be a Prius, be able to use that and maybe charge up too instead of have to have fossil fuels, right? My husband would be happy as an environmental scientist <laughs> with that. Um, but neuromuscular efficiency is really important, right? I don't want energy leaks. I want us to be able to go for a long time and not feel tired, okay? Um, like I mentioned, boost bone density, right? Um, swimming and running are two sports where we generally have lower bone density, which is strange because running is an impact sport, right? You actually are impacting the ground, so you are creating new bone. It's called Wolf's Law. If you're ever looking for an interesting little Google session, okay? If you typed in Wolf's Law, wolf with an E, um, it talks about how the tendons pull on bone and when that happens, that creates new osteoblasts, new bone growth. Okay, so running does help with that, yes, but strength training is really, I'm gonna say queen, because I'm a lady. Okay, it's really the queen when it comes to bone density, increasing bone density, okay? Um, it's also great, obviously, as we know, for cardiovascular health, running is, of course, as well, but strength training actually helps us build new capillaries, which is kind of cool. It helps increase blood flow, which is really neat as well. 
Um, and it's also obviously very good for mental health too. There's been a lot of research done on how it can affect you running too. We've all had that euphoric state, runner's high, right? With endorphin release, okay? Strength training offers a very similar benefit. So if you're ever kind of you know, on an off season or an, a down tick in your mileage, strength training is a great way to still get that feeling and have that mental kind of boost throughout the day. Um, it definitely can increase overall muscular endurance. You are endurance athletes, right? So we want those muscles to be able to fire all the time and repetitively do it without getting hurt, right? Um, it can enhance your overall speed levels on race day. So, I mean, everybody wants to have a PR, I would imagine, on most races, right? We'd hope, we'd hope, okay? You can still keep, keep getting PRs. It doesn't matter your age or your level, okay? Um, but we wouldn't do it unless we enjoyed being slightly competitive, I would imagine. Okay, at least with ourselves, not necessarily always with others, okay? Um, but it can increase your overall speed, which is important for your final kick, right? When you're coming in and you're like, depending on your race strategy, and you're trying to get in for that last little burst, right? Sometimes we just don't have it. If you've been in a race where you feel like, ugh, I don't have that last kick, okay? Or you're trying to, even if you're an athlete, by the way, this applies to anybody who runs, not just endurance athletes, right? Trying to get to that last ball or that puck or whatever it might be, um, that last kick is important. And then obviously, you can build mental toughness too. You guys are mentally tough. That's why I said that respect thing in the beginning, right? I don't, I don't know how you do it. Like if I, somebody told me to go run a mile, I might go cry for a minute and then be like, oh, phew. all right, I think I can do this today, right? Um, I just, I, it just is hard for me, right? I've had six knee surgeries as well and torn both ACL, so you know. Disclaimer, it's still an excuse, right? Amy, we talked about excuses, <laughs> there's no excuse. Um, I have to find low impact ways, but it does build, I mean, strength training can build muscle toughness in a different way for you because it's something that's challenging in a new novel way. Um, and that's great for increasing your mental toughness on race day when you're running. Um, and then hopefully it can clear up nagging injuries. We've already talked a little bit about injuries, but we wanna try to clear those up and see if we can help you feel better. It's something that's nagged you for years, right? If you get in the weight room and be consistent for a little bit, you might notice, oh wow, my back doesn't really hurt anymore. Or that shoulder thing I had, it's, I, don't, I haven't noticed it in a few weeks, right? Um, it's kind of interesting that way. It's kind of like magic. So we're gonna talk about lifting barriers to uh, well lifting, okay? Um, we just, I want to debunk some common myths that we have out there, okay? Um, especially with running and strength training. These are things I've all, I've heard every one of these, okay? Um, whether it was at the OA Performance Center or here at UNE or training other clients of my own. Um, I want to try to help us kind of get over this. So it'll slow me down, right? Or make me big and bulky. Strength training will give me big bulky muscles and I won't be as fast. Absolutely not, okay? If you're trying to be a bodybuilder, maybe, okay? So there is a way to train to help us not be like that, but we're gonna gain muscle density, right? Our muscles aren't gonna get big and bulky necessarily, okay? They're gonna just get more firing ability, okay? They're gonna get stronger and be a little denser, okay? That's it, right? Um, running is enough of a workout for my legs. How many of you have kind of heard that before? Or I don't need to strength train, right? Okay, because I'm, I'm gonna run, so my legs are fine. Well, they're good at doing that one sagittal motion, right? But they're not getting the left and right, they're not getting the backward, okay? They're not getting the plyometric movements, okay? The power things. So we do need to do more than that. Um, I'll be too sore to run the next day. Every time I lift, I'm super sore and then I don't wanna go back in the weight room and I just, I wanna avoid it, right? Well, yeah. You will be a little bit sore, delayed on muscle, onset muscle soreness, DOMS, okay? But the more consistent you are, the less that will happen. The less and less it will happen, okay? Consistency is key, right? I already have an injury. Why would I wanna go do more, <laughs> okay? We laugh at that one, but I hear that one all the time. Well, I'm already hurt, like why would I go do more to myself? Well, again, I've already kind of talked about that, right? Adding strength and moving well is, is gonna help us avoid said injuries and it might even help us heal faster. There's actually research on that as well. Um, but it's one I hear all the time, I'm hurt, I can't lift today. Hmm. You have three of the limbs and a core, so let's figure that out. There's always something we can do. I love finding those sorts of things. Maybe it's because I've been hurt so much myself. Okay, I'm kind of good at working around things. But I mean, again, Alyssa, I can, can attest to that, right? Oh, you're hurt today? Well, cool, let's do something different for your upper body or let's do this with the rope. And they're like, oh my God, she's crazy. Um, I don't have enough time. Is time a factor for us? Like I barely have enough time to get in my mileage. I don't have time to get in the weight room as well, okay? Or I don't have access to a gym, so it's not gonna work for me. I hear that one all the time over the summer, especially, okay? Um, you really only need, we'll talk about it in a little bit, two 30 minute sessions a week. That's an hour. An hour to two hours of time a week. 
right? There's a lot of time in a day, and I'm busy too. A very, very demanding career. I've got a three-year-old at home. So I'm a student, as Amy mentioned, okay? Um, but just finding time is really key, okay? If you can squeeze in your mileage, I guarantee you can find a half hour for yourself, okay? Um, blank told me not to because it conflicts with my training. Someone told you not to, whether it's a coach, right? A doctor, which you should listen to your doctor, I should say that. But I have heard that. My physician told me I shouldn't, like, strength training's not for me. Which I'm like, what physician told you that? Okay. I used to be in charge of training the fellows at the, at the OA Performance Center. Um, and I was like, I'm in charge of the doctors? Like, what? Um, but they loved it because they're like, now I understand why this is so important for my athlete, you know, the athletes that come to me, right? So, again, just don't always take things for face value. Find information from different areas. Don't just accept one way of thinking, okay? Um, I have no idea what exercises I should be doing. Has anybody ever felt that way? Like, I'd love to start, but I don't really know where to start, okay? Um, that's where hopefully I come in and I can help you out, okay? I would love to be that person for you. And I've tried doing it. I got, it got boring. I don't want to do it anymore, which I'm like, running for me, like, over. I'd be like, uh, I'm like, well, okay, I, I respect that. But at the same time, like, uh, they're like, the road changes. The scenery changes. I'm like, oh, my God. So, again, respect. I have, it's complete respect, okay? We just have to find a way to meet in the middle. It got boring because you didn't change your program. Okay, and you should change your program every four to six weeks. It should be new, okay? And every once in a while, I spice something new in for my athletes all the time, just to kind of keep them on their toes and make sure they're thinking, right? Um, so that's why we're going to actually design a program in a little bit, because I want you to understand how to do it and then how you can employ it in the future, okay? So hopefully that helps kind of clear some of those things up for us, okay? Um, so do the simple things savagely well. That's all it takes, okay? When it comes to the weight room, getting started, it's daunting at times, especially if you've never really been in or you, you kind of have done the same routine for years and years, which is something I've come up against, okay? At least you're in there. That's awesome. But can we change things up a little bit? Again, be open-minded about it, okay? With the right tools and mindset, it's, it's definitely simple, okay? Um, if you can dedicate, like I said, 30 to 45 minutes two or three times a week, you're going to see huge dividends. It's going to make a big difference for you. Um, if you can pair it with a, re a recovery or light run, that's the best time to kind of spice it in. So if you've gone on like a big jaunt for the day, okay, or you've had a real tempo run or whatever, and you're feeling a lot tired neurologically, I'm not necessarily talking physically, right, but if you don't have a lot of mental capacity that day, probably not a great day to strength train because it is mentally taxing, right? We talked about the mental toughness piece of it. Um, you want to train your whole body, not segments, okay? So if we thought, you know, it's leg day, right? That little bit moji with me back squatting in the very beginning had leg day on the bottom of it, and I was like, eh, crop it out. Okay, um, our whole body works as an entire unit. We can't rely on just working one segment at a time. That's not how we run, correct? Okay, the whole song, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, that old song, right? It's true, it's how it works. We have a, a kinetic chain that moves together. Okay, so we need to make sure we're training our whole body. Um, we want to attack our needs before our wants. Does everybody have an exercise that they just love to do? Right, I do, right? Like, yeah, deadlift, let's go every day. It would not be good for my back and hamstrings if I did it every single day. I gotta balance myself out, right? Um, but you want to attack your needs before your wants. Okay, I can bench press almost 155 pounds, but I struggle to do 10 push ups. Figure that out. Okay, <sighs> strength coach life. Okay, um, but it's because I have a high level of what we call absolute strength, I can move other things, but I'm not great at moving myself, hence two ACL injuries and six knee surgeries. Okay, so I have to attack my needs, my relative body strength before my wants. Okay, so that, that's an important lesson to learn. And you do that with assessment. We'll talk about that in a minute. Being consistent, I just mentioned that, right? Okay, if you, if you go in and you cherry pick your stuff and you go in and out and you're like always sore, it's because you're not being consistent. Just give yourself four weeks. Give yourself one month, okay, and see if you notice a difference. Um, and then, again, never underestimate simplicity. Okay, I'm going to have Alyssa in a few minutes demonstrate a few exercises for us. She's super nervous about it. You'll be, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, okay? Uh, but we're gonna do simple things, okay? And I tell my athletes this all the time. They wanna do bells and whistles and craziness. And I'm like, that's fun, I like that stuff too. But until we can s do simple things savagely well, we shouldn't move on to things that are more challenging, right? So just spice in the simple things, okay? So we're gonna talk about checking ourselves before we wreck ourselves, okay? So these are just quick assessments that you guys can do, and I'll gladly send this PowerPoint to whoever would like it. 
All right, I'll email it right to you. My, again, my email's at the end of the presentation, and it's on our athletics website as well, okay? Um, these are from a guy named Michael Rosengart. He is a physical therapist and strength and conditioning coach. Um, he does a lot with social media. Usually, it's where most of his platforms are. It's called Prehab, um, and it's a capital P, capital H, so P-R-E, capital H-A-B. Um, and he has an incredible, the, all of these little graphics are from him, okay? So I always make sure I like to give credit where credit is due. Yeah, I did not make these. That would be great, but I'm not that talented. Um, so looking at ankle alignment, remember I talked about from the ground up? Okay, looking at feet from the ground up, okay? We want to, are you a pronator? That means that your legs, your ankles turn out, your feet turn out. Are you neutral, which is where we want to be? Or do you supinate, which means that you're turning out or turning in the other way, okay? Most of us are not neutral. It's just as a human thing, we, we tend to struggle with that. Um, has anybody ever been to Maine Running Company to get their shoes? Most of us, okay. They do a great job, yes, with assessing this. They're great. So I would say if you're, gonna, if you're looking for someone to kind of help you with that, that's a great place to go to start. Or I'm happy to watch you walk, okay. A nice little turf stretch in the weight room. Pop off your shoes, take a few steps. I can help you out with that, okay. Um, the second one is a standing knee tuck or a single leg stability. So all you're going to do is just draw that knee up. And you would be surprised, like, oh, that's simple. Okay, try it and don't fall over, okay? Running is a single leg stance exercise. You spend all of your time on one leg. True or false? Do you ever have two feet on the ground running? Yeah. Race walk, maybe? Someone always brings up race walk. I'm like, oh, my God, race walk. Okay, um, where you have to have, right? But it's a single leg stance activity. Okay, so we want to make sure that you can do that. That's a quick little thing to figure out. Do I need more single leg strength? Okay, or balance. Single leg squat, those two kind of kind together. If you're okay with the single leg stance, great. Try a single leg squat. Can you get down to 90 degrees and back up without holding on to anything or wobbling or falling over? I really can't either, so I don't feel bad. Okay, but it's something we should always work on. Okay, um, trunk stability push up. Okay, so base, this is based on the FMS, the functional movement screen I mentioned way back in the early beginning. Okay. Um, where we want to see everything rise and up and come back down in a push-up together. We don't want to see like the inchworm, okay? We don't want to see that. We want to see our whole body rise up and come back down. That means we're maintaining a neutral spine, good pelvic stability, and all those sorts of things, okay? Um, seated spinal flexion and extension, this one would surprise you. Okay, all you're going to do is just sit, feet flat on the floor, knees at 90 degrees, see how far back you can go, and see how far you can curl your nose towards your your knees, get your elbows to touch your knees, okay? Thoracic spine, so we're, we're talking about the middle segment of our spine, is really important for runners. That's where all of our upper body movement originates from, okay? Which we talked about the arms are the what? You remember? They drive the legs, right? They're the engine, okay? They drive it for us. So if you're tight and stiff in your T-spine, that's another place we might want to address with our soft tissue and mobility, okay? And then wall slides for shoulder mobility. Again, we talked about how usually we don't have a whole lot of issue with shoulders and runners. I say usually, okay? But sometimes if there's something going on with the foot or ankle, it masquerades as shoulder pain, okay? So it's a good idea to know, be able to figure this out. If this bothers me, is it not something that's, you know, it's not necessarily my shoulder. Maybe it's my foot or my ankle, okay? Um, and your body works in slings like that. So from your right heel to your left shoulder and ear and vice versa, okay? It's a fascial system. So fascia's... There's no other way to put this, but if you buy a nice cut of meat, right, the white gristle, that's fascia, okay, on our muscles. It's very thick, right? We don't like to chew on it or try to cut through it, right, okay? But that's fascia. It doesn't like to move, right? So it's very stiff and gives us support in our body. Um, and, again, that's a whole other pres presentation for another day. But I can give you more information if you'd like it in the future. So it's just a good idea to know where your shoulders are at because it can dictate other things in your body, okay? So controlling our controllables. Really, running creates a ton of force, right? Every step is a lot of force, okay, on our body and on our joints. And if we're not absorbing that force through our muscles and tendons, it's going to go to our bones. And that's where we end up with stress fractures or repetitive type shin splint injuries and those sorts of things. Or if have, any, have you ever heard that you don't foot strike the right way, that you heel strike or forefoot strike or whatever it might be? Okay, we want to be a midfoot strike generally. We don't want to be on the balls of our feet, really, unless we're sprinting. Um, or in our heels, unless we're in the weight room. But with running, we want to be in a midfoot stance, right? Okay. Um, but we want to be able to control those ground reaction forces. And these are three ways to do that. Moving mindfully, okay, through each phase of the lift, right? We want to incorporate what are called eccentric and isometrics. Okay, so if I'm going to make a bicep, okay, like a where's the beach muscle, okay? 
Freddie's that way, right? Fortune's that way. But as I come up, this is concentric. My muscle gets tighter, okay? It stiffens and contracts. If I was to hold it, that's isometric. If I was to lengthen it, that's eccentric. And eccentric is always harder, okay? So when you're training, especially your lower body as a runner, you want to incorporate a lot of movements that make your legs, your hamstrings specifically, okay? It makes them lengthen out over time, okay? That's really important. I'll show you that with the goblet squat when Alyssa does it in a minute, okay? Um, and you want to train all three planes of motion. I already mentioned that like three or four times. You guys get that it's important, right? Okay, making sure we're addressing our whole body, not just one specific, you know, specific plane of motion, okay? So stepping up to the starting line, you guys gaining education on this topic is a great start, but then where do you go from there, right? So your program should include these three components. Okay, should always include a warm up. Like I already talked about, you want to address your soft tissue, the joint mobility and stability. Okay, um, you want to increase your core temperature. You want to actually sweat. At the end of your warm up for the weight room, if you're sweaty, good. That means you're ready to go, right? I actually look at my athletes, I'm like, are you sweating yet? They're like, no, I'm like, you didn't do it right. Okay, like you just kind of glaze through it. You should be a little bit sweaty because it should be a little bit neurologically challenging. Okay, that's how you know it's a good warm up. Okay, if you're wobbling a little bit and those sorts of things, that's good. Um, and you want to activate, like I said, that neuromuscular system. Okay, we call it the AMAS system. We basically want to try to assess, we want to mobilize, okay, we want to activate our muscles, we want to stabilize them, and then strengthen them. That's the pattern we want to follow. Okay, and then strength work. We want to include your major muscle groups, right? Your core, for sure. You'll see how important that core is over and over and over again and be three-dimensionally minded, all three planes of motion, right? You should um, be designed with muscular imbalance in mind, so you don't want to be using all the muscles on the front side. We call them the mirror muscles, because they're what we can see. Okay, you've all seen that people at the gym, right? Like in the mirror, like, yeah. Like, okay, yeah, it was good, but like, let's work on stuff off on the back. Okay, if you look as good as you do coming as you do leaving, you're great. Okay, that's what we want. We want our back half, our posterior chain to be strong. Okay, we really need that to be in play. Um, and we want to start, and we'll write this down, three sets of six to eight repetitions, okay? So they're supersetted, which means they're partnered together. You'll see how that works. Um, that's a good place to begin for a lot of people, and that really is going to help us build strength, which is what we're talking about today, okay? There are other sets and rep schemes out there for sure, but this is the simple way to get started that works. It's effective, okay? And then you want to have your cool down. So you want to incorporate your flexibility, and you want to maybe add in some mental rehearsal or visualization here as well. How many of you visualize running a race? Yeah, that's awesome, Joe. I love it. Okay, and that doesn't surprise me. Um, but you should. If you can find a place to lay down or sit quietly, okay, shut your eyes and just imagine what, the, what it's going to feel like when you're at the starting line in Cape Elizabeth. How many of you are running the Beach of Beacon? Awesome, okay. And you're there and you're standing there ready to go. And you've got people, you can hear the people around you, you can probably smell the ocean right? Maybe, hopefully there's a breeze. <laughs> hopefully it's not humid main days like we've had. Um, you, you can hear the excitement in the air. You can probably just, there's smells, there are sounds, there are things to feel, okay? Um, that's important. Get all of your systems firing on go. It's a great way to add in in your cool down, okay? Just try to do something like that that helps you visualize, why did I just, you know, do what I did in the weight room? Why did I just work hard? Why did I just run all of those miles, right? It's because you want, you want something out of that race on race day, Right? Whether it's you know, a, a specific PR or just to get a little bit better or to do it for someone else. Or we all have our reasons, right? Add that in. It's a good thing to do. We do that a lot with our athletes. So these are my top five exercises. I'm going to have Alyssa demonstrate, and then we'll go over our program here. Okay? Chin-ups, we can't demonstrate here, right? No. And she's like, oh, I'm working on my chin-ups anyway. So bring that dumbbell over here, Alyssa, for me. Okay, I'm going to pull this out. Hopefully I don't blow everybody's eardrums out. Oh, we're good. Okay. Um, so chin-ups, though, I'm going to start with that relative body strength, okay? How many chin-ups do we do? A lot. A lot, right? We, they're in every program, pretty much. I never lay off of them. They're like, can we have a break? I'm like, no, okay? Um, because they help with relative body strength and arm action, okay? So set that down for a second, though. Let's pretend you have the bar. We'll visualize. We just talked about that, right? So elbows are all the way straight, okay? She's going to pull down, right? Get that chin over the bar and go all the way back up. Okay, but when she pulls down, now give me arm action. Remember that? And then go chin to pocket with your hands. Okay, do you see how that's the same motion, right? Okay, chin-ups help our relative body strength, and they're excellent for helping us work on arm drive, which I said was the ignition 
to the engine, right? Okay. So the next one we're going to uh, learn right here is the, called a bird dog or a dead bug. Okay. So lay on your, we'll go hands and knees first. So we'll do our bird dogs. This is something we stole from yoga, okay? But she's got her knees directly underneath her hips, her hands are directly underneath her shoulders, and she's got both of her toes tucked in the back, okay? So she's gonna extend her right arm out and her left leg back, okay? And she's gonna do so keeping her pelvis facing the ground. So we don't want this big twist. That means we're losing pelvic stability, okay? So she wants to be here. And we're gonna try to do it without shifting. Yeah, harder, right? Okay, did you guys see what I just did there? Okay, she had shifted way over, okay? So Alyssa, just spin for me real quick. Do the same thing, we'll just give two views, right? Okay, so go ahead, yep, and point that hip down. So we, again, we don't want this, we want that, and we want that, <laughs> okay? So we want that nice single leg stability. So now flip over onto your back. Okay, these two are kind of, they're really two different exercises, but they get after the same thing. Okay, pelvic control and core control. She's gonna do a dead bug, so hands go up to the sky. Okay, knees come up. She's gonna pull her toes up, a little bit of space between her knees, okay? And then she's gonna drive my foot into the ground. Remember that? Yes. Keep her head relaxed. You guys see that change in her? Relax again. Okay, go ahead, do it again. Now she's got her core activated, okay? So she's gonna lower this hand and this leg at the same time. Go ahead, get to the floor, yeah. Good, without letting that come back up, pull it back up, and then the other side. So she looks like a little dead bug. Okay, that's why they call it that. But the whole time she's doing that, trying not to let her back pop up off the ground. Okay, so she's really maintaining core stability and core strength the whole time. So if you're a lower back pain person, that guy. Okay, that's really important. So the next one, pop up for me, girl. Okay, I'm gonna hand you that, is the goblet squat. So we'll do a couple facing forward and a couple facing sideways. Okay, so she's got her feet shoulder width apart. She's got her weight in her heels, okay? And we just learned how to stack up the other day, so she's actually doing really good here, okay? She's not got her knees locked. A lot of times athletes will slam their knees backwards, okay? So that's pretty good right there. Go ahead and give me a goblet squat. She drops down to 90 and drives back up. Where's the weight in your feet? In her heels, okay? Not on the balls of her feet. Save that for running, okay? So go ahead and give me one more. Freeze at the bottom. So this would be an isometric. Just holding like this, really beneficial. Fun, right? Yeah, okay. So now face me, okay. So now she's gonna do the same exact movement, but we're gonna add that tempo or that eccentric movement into it, okay. So I want you to do, we'll do a four second down, two second hold, one second up. Ready? Four, three, two, one, one, two, one. Do one more just like that, go ahead. So she goes down over four seconds, weights in her heels, so her hamstrings are lengthening, and drives up, her quads tighten. You see how that works, okay? So adding an eccentric work like that, really important. Really important, okay? The next one, oh, and then if once that gets easy, single leg squat. Okay, I won't make you do that today, <laughs> okay? But holding the goblet in the same position, but now doing it on one leg. Running a single leg, right? Okay, so we gotta, we gotta work on it in the weight room. So the next one's a side plank, excuse me. So let's do a side plank, okay? So she's gonna have her elbow directly underneath her shoulder. She's gonna come up hand up to the sky, and she's gonna get her head back in line with her spine. Did you guys see that change? Okay, she went from this tucked position to being nice and stable, and she's gonna get her hips in line. Now she's stacked up from ear, shoulder, hip, knee, ankle. Okay, so she's working on her lateral core. This is a different plane of motion than just that sagittal. Yeah, I wanna get a little more advanced. Okay, go back down there one more time. Okay, once that gets easy, go ahead, go back up. See if you can get yourself stacked. Good job. Okay, keep this steady. Remember these? Okay, it's called perturbation. I'm not doing this to be mean, okay? I'm doing it to challenge her core and her stability. Okay, so have a friend work you around like that. Good job, okay? Um, so now, stay down there, sorry. You're good for a minute. Uh, Push-up variations. Okay, so let's show them the trunk stability push-up. So lay on your belly, okay? So what I want you to watch initially, this is something Liz and I are always working on, okay? Let's do a push-up, go ahead. Oh, it's getting better, okay? You see how her head dropped though a little bit and her lower back came a little bit like after her upper body? Go ahead, back down, kiddo. Now, curl those heels towards your butt. So, nope, pull them this way, <laughs> like this. There you go, so go from the knees instead. Okay, so toes still pull towards your shins, that keeps her glutes activated. Okay, nice deep breath in, go. Better, right? 
because I changed her leverage point. So even going from the knees, everyone's like, oh, I can do push-ups from my toes. I'm like, that's great, but you can't do it without inchworming. Okay, so let's get better. Let's go back one more time. Okay, so this little drill right here, doesn't matter how good you are at them, going back to this, okay, she's going to get her back turned on. She's going to take a deep breath in to fill up her diaphragm, okay, get her diaphragm to work, and then she's going to squeeze her butt and go. Boom, much better, right? That's cleaner mechanics. It's going to help her stay stronger and safer, okay? Now the last one, you tired yet, Liz? Okay, good. Okay, up on your feet is a single leg deadlift. So we're going to go single arm, single leg. Okay, so she's going to have the, we'll put the dumbbell in your left hand actually. Okay, so she's going to stance on her right leg. So soft bend in her right knee. Okay, she's got her shoulders and her hips squared up. She's stacked up like the start of that goblet squat. And she's going to push her left foot back towards me. Go ahead. Soft bend in that knee. Good. And then back up. This is ch more challenging than it looks. Go ahead again. Yes. And then pull yourself all the way back up tall. Do one more for me. Okay. See how she's not really bending a whole ton at the knee? It's soft, she's not locking it. Okay, where do you feel that? Hamstrings. hamstrings, okay? So again, we talked about having a strong posterior chain, how running is a hamstring dominant exercise, right? So this one's a great one to start with. If you struggle with the single leg thing, okay, you saw Alyssa wobble a little bit, okay? Let's show them an RDL. So Romanian deadlift, okay? J yeah, just pretend, no, two feet down, but just pretend you have two dumbbells. So you'd wanna hold two dumbbells for this one. Okay, so she's going to just shift her hips back towards me, soft bend in her knees, and come all the way back up. But she's keeping that nice, neutral spine that she had before. Okay, so that's one if you're really struggling with the single leg balance, that will help you with the, the two legs and eventually progress to the one leg. Okay, great job, Liz. Give her a hand. <laughs> all right, so now we'll move on to designing a program for everybody. Okay, this is the actual summer program for UNE cross country. Okay, um, this is what they've been working on throughout the summer. I hope I'm not allowed to follow up with them necessarily for NCAA Division Three rules, but this is what they were given. Okay, um, in order to help them hopefully come back and repeat as champions. Okay, so you'll see that they have a warm up that matches the warm up that's in your packet that you have. Okay, does everybody in here have a packet? Yes, okay, and again, we can send this out for you, all right, um, but that's there for you. Basically, just so you know, it has all those planes of motions built within, okay? This rest and recovery log is at the end of your packet. I ask my athletes to fill in the rest and recovery log every single day. It's like golf, you want a low score, okay? So number one is good. That's called gnarly nor'easter. That means you're feeling great, okay? Number two is meh, I'm okay, because I'll be like, how you doing today? Meh, I'm okay, okay? You're all right, you're in between. And a three is just nope, just nope, not having a great day, okay? So I want you to rate yourself on soreness, sleep, and nutrition. Your soreness levels, how well you slept, okay? And then how well you ate. I would say if you get all your meals and a couple snacks, great, that's a one. If you missed a meal, automatically a two, okay? If you missed two meals and hardly had a snack, eh, that's just nope, just nope, okay? Um, if you slept at least eight hours, that's a one. Six to eight hours, that's a two. Anything less than six is three. How many of us get at least that much sleep every night? Good, good, at least that's that, right? Okay, I try to, but I mean, it's hard, sleep's hard. But that will help you understand, when you go to lift, or run even, and you do this, okay, and you go to fill it out, and you're like, wow, no wonder I had a rough day. I don't feel good, I have like a nine. Okay, that's sad, right? You wanna be closer to a three than a nine, okay? Um, this is their workout. I know this is hard to see, okay, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like. It looks just like the template that you have in your packet if you flip the page, okay? Um, so this is what they have. They have three days a week. It takes about 60 minutes. They're collegiate athletes. I hope they, they can have the extra time to figure it out. They should anyway, okay? Um, and they know that they're supposed to do it on a day where they do a training or, a, you know, a, a light recovery day, okay, for a run or they don't run, okay? Which for them is like, oh, I always run. I'm like, nah. Let's focus on a few things, okay? So we're gonna learn how to design a program just like this right now, okay? So basically what I want you to do is somewhere on that packet, I think there's a spot that says soft tissue up the top, right, okay? I put in some options there for you, but I want you to write down what you know is stiffest and tightest, okay? So go ahead and write down three things that generally are pretty stiff and tight on you. Oh, perfect, okay? 
don't have to overthink it. Just like if you know that your calves are tight or your upper back's usually sore or your hamstrings or whatever, okay? There's a foam rolling drill for it, okay? So I just want you to be aware of those things for yourself. The next thing, I have pick three to five of those stability or mobility drills. There are five, I believe, on the, on the front of the packet, okay? But you can keep the warm up as is, all right? Um, but I do have a YouTube channel that has videos of everything. So you can also pick and choose from that, okay? And then we want to build your supersets, okay? So if you guys find A1 in your little packet there, a lower body push is our quadriceps. It's quadricep dominant, so that would be a squat. Okay, so I want you to write squat in there. And then you can go to my YouTube channel after this, and you can pick which type of squat you might like to do. Does that make sense? I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. So write squat, okay? Um, and I want you to write three by eight in the first square next to it. Okay, so we're right here, okay? A2 is an upper body pull. So that would be a row, yep, or a chin-up variation, okay? So you can put row in there. Okay, or chin, or chin up, I should say, okay, or pull up. And again, three by eight, so you're going to fill in that three by eight all the way down, okay? B1 is a lower body pull, so that would be like what Alyssa showed at the end there, that single leg deadlift, okay? It's a hip hinge or deadlift dominant type pattern, so right in deadlift, okay? And that sounds scary. It's really not. You could do so many different things with it. You could do a hip bridge, okay? You could do stability ball leg curls. There's lots of variations. Um, upper body push would be a push-up, like Alyssa showed, okay? Or a dumbbell bench press or something like that, okay? So it's chest dominant. And then C1, core anti-rotation. That sounds so fancy, okay? It really is just like a bird dog that I showed you, okay? You're controlling that rotation, right? Running is rotational in nature. Your pelvis is rotating a little bit every step you take, but the more we control it, the less trouble we get into with our ankles, knees, and hips, and lower back, okay? So that would be like that bird dog, for example, okay? Um, a carry variation. Alyssa, we'll show real quick. Show me a farmer's carry, okay? I know we're going to catch it in the camera in just a second. She just walks and carries it like a bucket switch hand, so it's by the camera, kiddo. Yeah, there you go. We'll stage it well, okay? So she's just literally carrying weight and walking, but she's maintaining that stacked up posture that I showed you in the very beginning, okay? So you can write farmer carry. There's lots of different variations, but farmers are great, okay? Carry, I love farmers, they keep us fed, okay? But carry the bucket. Um, and then it says four by, uh, or three by 40 yards in there, some distance, some sort of distance, okay? And the core anti-rotation, I'm sorry I jumped over that. I put in 10 repetitions because it's core based, so it's a little more endurance related, okay? So D1, I have breathing or yoga, okay? In my YouTube channel, you'll be able to find all kinds of stuff like that, all right? Um, but breathing, just working on breathing. Even if you just laid there, is it savasana? Is that what it's called? You just lay on the floor and breathe? Great, it's so good for us, okay? It's great for recovery and so many other things mentally, okay? Um, but it really does help your strength training, okay? So I have 45 seconds of that in there. And then D2 is a load and land plyometric. And you're like, oh, I haven't jumped and I don't know how long. Running is plyometric. It is a series of tiny little single leg hops for miles. So don't tell me you don't do plyometrics. <laughs> you're really good at them, OK? You're really, really good at them. Um, we have a lot of different little plyos we can do. Ladder drills are great for that, OK? Um, I used to love pulling out ladder drills with my my senior group at OA, I used to work with a group of people who were at least 65 or older, and they love the ladders, okay? There definitely is always a way you can add things in. Hurdle drills, little jumps on the floor, okay? But that kind of gives you an idea. I put by three. I don't, I don't need a ton of repetitions. I just need quality, which, by the way, that's another soapbox moment. Quality over quantity always. Quality comes first, okay? So eventually you'll see there's three by eight for three weeks, and then it drops down to three by six. When it drops from three of eight repetitions to three of six, what do you think I want you to do with the weight? Yeah, go up. Joe knows. I've been training <laughs> for a while, okay? Um, I want you to go up if it's easy. If it's easy, it's because it is, okay? And if it's easy, we're not growing and we're not changing, all right? So anytime it feels easy, go up and wait as long as your form and technique can maintain it, okay? Does that all make sense for us? Yeah? Okay. Um, so 
I do have an Instagram channel. Um, I'm on it almost daily. Probably I get made fun of a lot for it. It's okay. Um, but I love it, okay? My student athletes really enjoy it. And if you want to follow me on it, please do. Um, I put out a lot of good information on nutrition, on training topics, on a little bit of everything. What's going on in the weight room with our student athletes, if you want to follow that. Um, but it's a really good educational resource for you. And then we also have the YouTube channel, okay? Um, so I'm going to back out of this really quickly. And I'm going to show you the YouTube channel. And I can always send you the link if you'd like the email. But if you just search Nor'easter Strength and Conditioning right here, you'll find it. It pops right up. There's no protections on it. Okay? It's just you can subscribe to it and follow it. All right? Um, but if you go down through, everything's listed by type. So there's playlists of exercises. Does that follow? Okay? So if you are looking for a step-up variation, which is also a lower body push, by, or, by the way, instead of a squat, you could do a step-up, okay? Um, or a squat variation, or a chest variation, hamstring or posterior chain, deadlift, okay? Push-up variations, carries. I mean, they're all in there. There's soft tissue preparation with foam rolling. Um, we also have a whole warm-up drill one, okay, you can pick from. So there's all kinds of options in here of me doing all these little things. More of me, aren't you lucky, okay? Um, but feel free to use this as a resource, okay? And build your program as such. So I just paired a, a lower body push with an upper body pull. That's muscular balance. Anterior dominant for my lower body, posterior dominant for my upper body. I'm just balancing myself out, and it's a great way to, to initially start building strength in the weight room, okay? Without overtraining any particular type of muscle group, all right? So I'm closing, my friends. I'll get this back up here for us, okay? Oh, come on. I can't go backwards, that's okay. Um, we'll go like this from current slide, right? Okay. Um, but this is my email, okay? It's lliby2 at une.edu. I kept my student email, okay, on purpose. It does mess people up though, so I apologize. <laughs> but if you search Lindy Kelly in the email, like if you're from UNE, you'll find it. Um, if not, it's right there, and it is on our athletics website under strength and conditioning, so you can find it and ask me anything you want. Um, my number is also on the athletics website, so if you want to call and chat about something, always more than happy to do it. But best of luck in the Beach to Beacon, whatever your next race may be or next endeavor, um, and if I can be of service to you, let me know. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Lindy. That was amazing. And actually, you know, could do you mind um, also coming up and just saying um, uh, name, rank, and serial number, where you, what your major is, what your sport is, and where you're from? All right. I'm Alyssa Nicholas. I'm going to be a sophomore here at UNE. Um, I'm majoring in applied exercise science right now, and I'm currently on the women's basketball team. Looking to get our seventh championship next year, Yay. so some exciting stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, are there any questions for Lindy um, that we would like to address right now? And I will come chase you down with the microphone. Anybody? Yeah? Nutrition, anything, whatever. It has to be about what we talked about today. Um, so if you find, though, that you're getting the same injury again and again mm -hmm. and again, even though you're doing some strength training, yep. is that a good time to have, like, a, an assessment? Yes. To be like, why is it that you keep hurting yourself in that same? And how would you go about doing that? Definitely. Great question. So um, this is something that pops up a lot with my cross-country athletes, for sure, and all of my athletes here at UNE, too, um, where generally, you know, you're just trying to do, th trying to do the best you can and you're not really sure why it keeps happening, um, that might be a great time to then bring in if you have access to an athletic trainer or physical therapy. Um, so I'm really cognizant of scopes of practice. It's really important. So that I, as a strength and conditioning coach, my job is not to diagnose an athlete, right? I can troubleshoot, but if there's consistent or persistent pain that just will not go away, um, I would definitely run some assessments on that. But I'm not going to, I shouldn't give you basically like, oh, this is how you treat that. Does that make sense? Um, sometimes it could be a chronic thing with inflammation or different things like that too without knowing your situation. Um, but that's always a good time to maybe pull in, pull in a physical therapist into the, into the game. Um, and again, there's, there's lots of, of great individuals in the, in the area. I can definitely point you in the direction of, of someone who could help, um, who specializes in endurance athletes too. Um, but generally, people are kind of nervous to go do that because they don't want to be pulled out of running, 
right? Like, I don't, I want to compete. Like, the same thing as our athletes here. They generally, kind of, they always hide things, but they're, they're tough. You guys are tough, right? So you're like, ah, just, I'll keep battling through. But at some point, pain is an indicator. It's telling us something's wrong. So um, that would be my best course of action. Definitely, we could, we could, I'd be happy to, to run some assessment and see if I can maybe troubleshoot it and see what it is. But if it is, you know, one of, with the functional movement screen that I mentioned in the beginning, one of the, you score it one, two, or three. So zero is a presence of pain. That means it hurt, right? Like if it hurt you right away, you'd tell me, oh, that hurt. Um, one means it eh, couldn't really do the pattern I was asking you to do. Two means you did it, but you cheated to get it done. And we are master compensators, which is fine. Twos are great, actually, because we compensate every day. Um, and three means that you did the movement pattern perfectly. Does that make sense? So we could assess you with that and try to figure it out. Um, but if it gives you enough persistent pain, that's when it's good to say, hey, doc, you know, this is going on. And if we can get imaging, right? And they can say, well, there's actually, like, you know, nothing wrong structurally. Great. Then we can keep troubleshooting. But until we know, like, a picture of it and see what's going on with it, it's kind of tough to tell. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And then with strength training, Again, um, it's trying different things because sometimes what will bother you on one leg doesn't on two, right? So you might just, it's just making adjustments in the weight room um, and, and how you're doing things. And sometimes it's as simple as like with the stacking up thing, right? Okay, Alyssa's generally had some knee pain here and there, right? Shin, heavy feet kind of thing we've been battling and working with. Um, and a lot of it was just because she stood with her knees driven back towards the back of her knees. She didn't understand that she needed to use her hips more to centrate herself, right? So sometimes it's just postural awareness. I hate to say posture because everyone's like always aware of their posture, but it's understanding how you move. Yeah. Anybody else? Joe. <laughs> the agility, Amy. The agility. Right. <laughs> Lindy, first, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, what about the idea of mixing workouts? Mm -hmm. um, like the presentation you did had to fill up a chart. Yeah. Instead of doing that for four or five or six weeks, uh -huh. on day one do workout A, the next yep. time do workout B. So really that A workout, instead of going four or five weeks, would really go three times four or five weeks. If you yes, and I'm, I'm glad you just mentioned that, Joe. So I'm sorry I didn't clarify that. I'm really glad you brought it up. Workout A would be like Monday. Workout B would be Wednesday. Workout C, Friday. Okay, good, good question. Thank you. Yeah, so you want to make sure that you're, you're not doing the same thing over and over and over again, okay? Um, that even if it was two, if you just rotated A and B, Tuesday and Thursday, for example, okay? Um, that's a really great pattern to attack it, yes. So we want to make sure that we're kind of, because that would get awfully old every day, three days a week for six weeks, <laughs> okay? And that's where the boring concept comes in, right? So I want to give it just enough to be novel, to be neurolog neurologically challenging, right? But also to just to keep your interest engaged, right? Um, so you look forward to it. Today I'm going to go up in this one and I'm going to try to do this without falling over, and which is me usually. Um, but yes, does that clarify that for you? Awesome. Good question. Ah, I knew that was coming. Yes. Okay. So generally it's up to you individually. I would say if you're going to do like a, a really hard training run, right, if you're going to do any sort of mileage or really hard tempo, don't lift after if at all you can help. Does that make sense? Um, wouldn't be a bad idea to do some yoga or some rolling or that kind of thing. Um, but try to do it beforehand just because strength training is so neurologically challenging, right? Not to say that running isn't, but it's a pattern that you're already very good at, right? Strength training may, may not be your forte or it's something, or if it's a new exercise, it's your brain and your muscles and your neurological system have to work really hard together to make it happen, right? Um, so it's better to do it before, I think. And again, there's, there's kind of two camps on that too. Like, oh, you get a better, um, you know, training effect if you're already tired afterwards. Like, uh, depends on what your real goal is, right? But if you want to stay safe from injury and you want to see gains, a good time to do it is either before a hard run, okay, which if you can help it, I would love it if you did it like in the morning, did your run in the evening. Does that make sense? But I wouldn't try to go do a hard lift and then go out for mileage. That's not a good plan either for most people. Um, but you could also, if you have a training run planned or a recovery, or excuse me, a recovery run or a light run, um, then I think you'd be okay to do it right before or right after. Um, but you would also know, like, based on, you know, workout A, B, or C, right, if B really just gets you, like, oh, like that one, I'm always gassed after that one, maybe you don't run at all that day if you can adjust your training schedule, right? So you have to kind of tinker a little bit individually. It's just like nutrition. If you, you know what you can eat before you race or before you run, right? It took time to get that. 
you didn't know right away that, hey, I can have this and this and not, and my, my stomach feels good, right? So it just takes some awesome time individually too. Does that help? Yeah. Awesome, yeah. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, again, <laughs> Lindy, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And again, another reason why we're so lucky here at UNE to have people like Lindy here to share this great knowledge and enthusiasm. Uh, and thank you, Alyssa, for being here as well. And, and thank all of you who attended and all of you as well. Um, good luck. Have fun. If you have any questions, um, please reach out to Lindy. Yeah, fill my inbox, please. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank right, you. It. And signing off from UNE.